Hi, I'm Bob Orr, and this is Washington Unplugged. Today we're focusing on the CIA's enhanced interrogation program and brand new charges from former Vice President Dick Cheney that Attorney General Eric Holder now is playing politics with national security. Cheney is outraged that Holder has appointed a prosecutor to determine if any CIA employee or contractor broke the law in interrogating top al-Qaeda suspects like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and others. With me to talk about this today, Newsweek investigative reporter Mark Hosenball and also Mike German, a national security expert with the ACLU. Thanks for joining us. Before we get to the discussion, though, first, let's take a look at what Cheney said yesterday in an interview about the effectiveness of harsh interrogations. Chris, my sort of overwhelming view is that the enhanced interrogation techniques were absolutely essential in saving thousands of American lives and preventing further attacks against the United States and giving us the intelligence we needed to go find al-Qaeda, to find their camps, to find out how they were being financed. So that's Vice President Dick Cheney yesterday saying there's no doubt in his mind that enhanced interrogation techniques worked. Mark Hosenball, you broke the story with Newsweek about what was in the report. You've read the report. Is he right or not? Well, it is true that the CIA program to interrogate and detain uh, high value, whatever Al Qaeda detainees, produced a lot of intelligence. In fact, from the sounds of things, or from the looks of things from these documents, it actually produced the kind of the, the intelligence that was like totally central to the CIA's uh, intelligence gathering about Al Qaeda. As to the question as to whether the enhanced interrogation techniques, which some people call torture, work, that's a more difficult question. The documents themselves don't say that. They don't say uh, enhanced interrogation techniques work. Officials who worked on the program say it it worked. Uh, there is some circumstantial evidence in the documents that these guys, the uh, terrorists, started talking more after being subjected to enhanced interrogation techniques. But there's been no matching up of specific bits of information with specific techniques. There's also reason to believe that these techniques may have produced a whole pile of bad information, but there's been no assessment as to the ratio of bad information to good information that these techniques produced. And in any case, you know, the U.S. is signatory to treaties and laws which say you're not supposed to do this, uh, whether it works or not. So, you know, the, the, the debate as to whether it worked or not is a, is a kind of a strange debate. And the evidence that we've seen is not, uh, is not in any way, it's not even, dispo it's not dispositive. It's not even really, it doesn't begin to answer these questions. All right, but taking the vice president's viewpoint for a minute, it's 2001, 9-11's just happened. They're worried about another attack, maybe at any time. They lay out a series of enhanced techniques that the Justice Department at that time says are legal. Now, he says we followed those techniques and we got very important information from Abu Zubaydah, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Mike, how's it, how do, can you argue with that? Well, number one, it's uh, contradicted by an interrogator on the ground, uh, uh, Abu Sufan from the FBI, who said the rapport building techniques were actually working and that the, the torture techniques actually caused him to shut down and then they had to recover through rapport building techniques. So there is significant evidence that it didn't work. The CIA's own reporting, uh, which was conducted after Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, was waterboarded 183 times, which should be evidence enough that it didn't work, the fact that you had to keep doing it, uh, was entitled Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's Threat Reporting, Precious Truth Surrounded by a Bodyguard of Lies. So just as Mark was suggesting, the the evidence co coming out of those techniques is not necessarily reliable. But, you know, I think the point that Senator John McCain made on Face the Nation this weekend is really the, the more important point. It's that the terrorists gain from us doing this. And this is a lesson that the French learned in Algeria, that, that if you, you know, throw away your values and, and throw away international law, that actually helps the terrorists. The British learned that in, in their struggle against the IRA in the 1970s. Those are lessons we should have known on s September 12, 2001, and unfortunately we didn't look at that history that maybe could have helped us take a, a more correct path that would the have been more effective and wouldn't have undermined uh, our goals. The problem is among the base facts we know. We know since 9-11 there hasn't been a second attack. Uh, we know that Al-Qaeda's network has been somewhat, if not largely, disrupted. So we're really talking about trying to prove negatives. We can't prove that it didn't work. And, and could we have gotten the same information short of the harsh technique? Well, that's what we don't know, because they never tried that, and they never 
even did a proper study uh, as to what information came from what technique. That investigation, which probably should have been done a long time ago or should have been done as they went along with this program, is only now being done in a methodical manner by the Senate Intelligence Committee. And we're not even going to have, they, they have something like five to 10 million documents to examine in their investigation. So we're not even going to know about that for a year or more, I don't think. Uh, so, but, but the whole point was that they never really evaluated these two issues. Number one, did uh, did enhanced ter interrogation techniques work better than conventional, uh, you know, persuasive I interrogations? And number two, to what extent did such techniques produce bad information versus good information? And and you would have thought that at some point early on they would want to evaluate this, and they really didn't. You mentioned yeah. uh, the FBI interrogator Ali Soufan, who I think was the first to take a crack at Abu Zubaydah. Right. He said using rapport building techniques, he was making progress. Right. And that the progress ended when the CIA operatives came in and started using uh, the torture techniques. So I have to tell you, the, the papers contradict that slightly, saying that uh, progress continued after they used the techniques. The, the most recent paper you're talking yeah, about. And the, the document uh, and the raft of documents we've seen. Uh, right. At, at, but if you look at Ali Soufan's testimony, he goes through the timeline very carefully, saying when rapport building techniques worked and when the, the harsh techniques didn't. And in fact, uh, Scott Shane of the New York Times wrote a story, I think, in June of two, 2008 or 2009, uh, where he revealed that it was actually rapport building techniques used with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed by a CIA interrogator that actually worked and, and created the cooperation that's actually documented in the later report. I mean, I think the timing of the report is very interesting that, you know, right after the, these uh, water 183 waterboarding uh, episodes, uh, the CIA report says, you know, that it's full of lies, yet after Abu Ghraib breaks in 2004, a new document is produced that says how much valuable information came out. Now, there are a number of events that took place in the intervening years. I mean, it, any military or, or terrorist person who is captured knows they don't have to keep the information secret forever, just long enough for the information not to be valuable to the captors. So, of course, somebody two years down the line could give up everything and it's not really going to hurt. It w in the Black Liberation Army, they had a rule that you only had to be quiet for 24 hours. And they knew through their system, if somebody hadn't reached in and, and touched base within 24 hours, they had to change everything they're doing and move out of their location. So you don't have to remain silent forever. All right, I want to talk about the politics for just a minute. But first, let's take a look at what the Vice President said yesterday about Attorney General Holder's appointment of a prosecutor now. Investigations. Uh, I just, I think it's an outrageous uh, political act that um, will uh, do great damage long term to our capacity to be able to have people take on difficult jobs, make difficult decisions without having to worry about what the next administration is going to say. If the prosecutor asked. OK, what about that, Mark, uh, the politicization of this? I mean, the president himself has said he would prefer just to move forward instead of look backward. This could become a mess. Oh, it could become a mess. To some extent, it already is a mess. There are people at the CIA. I was just speaking to some people connected with, with their, before I came over here. They're, they're really freaking out over this. It is going to cause them to have second thoughts about doing you know risky things or creative things in the future. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. It is uh, you know, tying them down. Uh, you know, whenever you face a libel suit or investigation, you, know, you get tied down, even as a journalist, for months and months uh, and days. And, and these people are freaking out over this. And I think there is some political element in this, in the sense that the investigation that the Attorney General has, has announced is an investigation that to some extent, or maybe to a large extent, has already been conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alexandria. They already investigated many, or if not all, these cases that are going to be reinvestigated. And, uh, you know, why do that unless you're trying to make a political point, which is that we're not the Bush administration? Uh, I'm not sure that this is the smartest way to go. On the other hand, I mean, the Bush administration politicized justice from the top to the bottom. I mean, they, they were the ones who went to the to the hospital room of the attorney general to try and get him to sign off on some kind of, uh, you know, additional uh, uh, electronic surveillance, which some of the uh, subordinate uh, Justice Department people felt was completely outrageous and un unconstitutional. They were the ones who fired the uh, eight U.S. attorneys, uh, uh, federal prosecutors in various districts because they weren't pursuing Republican Party goals to get people. So, you know, it's a little bit like the pot calling the kettle black here with Cheney saying stuff like that. Okay, and finally, Mike, I just want to ask you, uh, what about this argument? What about an ends justifies the means argument? We're talking about protecting the civil rights, if you will, of some admitted terrorists. 
uh, against this notion that we, we need to have critical national security information that may prevent another attack. So in the end, can't we look back and just say, oh, that's okay because it worked? No, I, I think that's exactly the point that John McCain was making, that we're actually doing more damage to ourselves long term by turning away from the rule of law, and that actually fuels the terrorists and helps them recruit. And, you know, he, he talked about having talked directly with terrorists in, in uh, Iraq who said that, that, you know, Abu Ghraib gave them uh, a recruitment bonanza and allowed them to do it. And if you look at, at, at terrorist movements throughout the years, which I did in my book, you know, you see that over and over again, that where, where the law is bent to incorporate these, these short-term concerns, that becomes a rallying cry and a recruiting tool for the terrorist group to show that, see, the law really doesn't apply to the people in power. It only applies to us little people, so we have to make sure it doesn't apply to us either, and we are therefore justified in using violence. The debate's going to go on and on. Very interesting. Oh, for years. <laughs> okay. Mike, Mark, thanks very much for coming in today. And thanks to you for watching Washington Unplugged today. Of course, we're here every day at cbsnews.com at 12.30 p.m. I'm Bob Orr. Have a great day. Thank mm -hmm. you.